Okay, so I've got this envelope which uh, I use for, to bring about change, but we'll, we'll talk about that later. So, uh, the, uh, the first slide is, is just to remind me to, the, the, the name of the conference is R&D Research and Discovery. I actually, when I first read that, assumed it meant research and development because I, that's essentially what I've done. I, I first joined the pharmaceutical industry back in uh, the late 70s as a research scientist and I'm now working the uh, development part of the organisation. So for those of you uh, not familiar with the difference, the research is where you do the drug discovery, for example, where you uh, look for the new active ingredients and the development the development is the bit where you actually start to scale up your uh, processes and you're looking towards developing a manufacturing process where you can make uh, the active ingredients uh, safely and uh, with the right amount of quality. And so when you look at this guy, this is what he's got in that tub is a, a keg of white powder. There could be about uh, a few kilograms of, of white powder. And that could be as, worth as much as £100,000 in that container. And what I want you to think about is that what would happen if a, if a couple of weeks later that, inf that powder went missing? Would people be comfortable about that or would they be held to pay? And the interesting thing is in development you do two things essentially. You make, you make powder, you make things that you actually put into medicines. But the other thing that you do is that you, uh, you generate knowledge, you generate uh, process understanding. And the opportunity is this, in that our ability to uh, generate process understanding and retain process understanding is actually really challenging. It's probably more challenging than, than making the, the drug itself. So if I can indulge, ask for something just very quickly, could you all stand up please? Now, if you're a scientist or an engineer, or you study science or engineering, could you please stay standing? Everybody else, sit down. Okay, for those scientists and engineers who are still standing, put your hand up if you actually have come across a technique called experimental design. Okay, so those, those of you, sit down, please. So what you've left is that you've got the opportunity now. These are the people who haven't actually come across experiment design or perhaps not had the opportunity. And one of the things that's... Thank you, if you could sit down. So, so one of the things that surprises me really is that why haven't we... Why isn't this thing called experiment design taught more widely in universities or at schools? And if you look at the, on the website, if you look at the Royal Society of Chemistry website, for example, it suggests you do one, uh, experiments one factor at a time. In other words, you look at one factor and keep everything else constant and you see what the impact of doing that is. And uh, if you look at the BBC Science website, it says the same thing. It promotes this idea of changing only one factor at a time. One of the interesting things about experiment design is that you actually get to change uh, uh, all of the factors all of the time. So in other words, if you had time, temperature and pressure, you might look at low temperature, low time, low pressure, or high temperature, high time, high pressure, and then various combinations. And because you've got a, a number of combinations of uh, experimental sets you can do, you know in advance what a set of experiments you're going to do are. The great advantage of that is that you can actually start to, once you've performed all those experiments, you analyze the results, and you're able to use statistical methodologies to actually generate far richer understanding than if you do using one factor at a time experimentation. And the thing that really surprised me about this was that I'd worked for 15 years in the chemical industry without realizing that these techniques exist. And since then, I've been actually teach, going into universities and teaching it in universities. And again, all the time I come across uh, students and professors and lecturers who haven't come across the, the technique uh, either. So the big question is, how do you get organizational change 
to happen. You know, so we're not just talking about the company I work with, we're talking about the whole of the pharmaceutical industry, we're talking about how science is taught in universities and in schools. It's a massive uh, uh, thing that we've got to take on board here. So the opportunity is enormous, and particularly once you start using these techniques, you realize how effective they are and how uh, profound uh, the understanding that you get when you use them. So, the very first time I did a, an experiment design, I was really excited. Uh, uh, the previous speaker, Janet, talks about you know, the, the excitement and the fun and you, how much you learn. And when I got the results back from this, I was genuinely uh, uh, impressed. So I gave a talk, and, uh, and this is a cartoon by David Shrigley. And uh, for those of you who can't read it at the back, it says, the lecture that you gave was not well received. And these people are saying, boring, boring rubbish, and I want to kill you. And that was, that was the first time I gave a lecture on experiment design, and I wasn't prepared for that. You know, I, I generally thought that this was a really impressive technique, and I just really wasn't prepared for people to, you know, not, not like what I, I did. And I've, you know, over the years I've given many talks on this and, and uh, occasionally, you know, I've had that same sort of uh, response that people don't want to actually know about this. And one of the reasons that is, is that you are, you do actually realize that you have to face um, a lot of, uh, uh, do a lot of repetitive uh, experiments. So the idea here is that I just thought, well, how can we get around that problem? And so, it's all Prosper about... will allow us to develop much more robust chemical processes and also to be much more efficient in our activities within the laboratory. With Prosper, we have 52 vessels, so we're able to carry out um, a large number of reactions very quickly. We have individual... So, um, what happened there is that I was trying to work out how you would kind of promote this idea that you could do the practical experimentation that went with this technique. And uh, the key to it, I thought, was to make experimentation cheaper. So if you could make it easier to run the experiments, then that would actually increase the uptake of these techniques. The only trouble is to make the experimentation cheaper, we had to build a robot that cost over half a million pounds. And, uh, and even now, I kind of look back to 20 years ago and think, mm, you know, was this, the, was this the smartest way of actually bringing in new, new technology? Because I was actually trying to bring in automation and new methodologies for doing experimentation at the same time. But the advantage that once we built the robot, and we had to build it because you couldn't buy these things at, at, at the time, uh, technology has moved on now, you can buy these sort of uh, uh, parallel experimentation systems now. But this was, this was a really important advance because what, that, what we were able to do was as many as 50 experiments at a time. You could get the, the uh, uh, robot to add liquids at, uh, at different amounts and different speeds, and you, can, you could control each of the uh, vessels at different temperatures, and you got different needles to uh, look at to minimize contamination. The, the advantage of doing that is that you got a very good signal-to-noise ratio. So you're actually able to see what was causing the change you're experimenting without worrying about uh, a lot of the background variability that was taking place. So, um, so if we roll on to the present day, we're still looking at, uh, so even though we work in development, a lot of what we do is research and discovery. And so we're working at the moment with Southampton University, collaborating on new methodologies to look at how we best assess uh, the probable risk of uh, the quality associated with drug uh, manufacture. And this is the type of models that we can build. And like the previous speaker, one of the things that struck me about um, watching children play games, I saw my son playing Civilization III, and all the time you're being bombarded with statistics and things are happening here and things are happening here. And he's able to memorize all this thing that's going on and assimilate all the information as it's coming in. And as a scientist, you, you're doing the same thing. You're actually looking at um, how you need to adapt your uh, hypothesis of how things are working as the information changes. and has, So your process understanding evolves as you do more and more experimentations. So it's all about 
how you connect the different pieces of, of work that you do. So one of the things that we've so one of the things that we've done is we've looked now, we're looking at dashboarding information. So we're actually looking about structuring the models that we make, putting them together in the same place, looking at, in this particular case, what we, we, we're doing now is we're visualizing data from one data set, but we're not just looking at it in one way, we're looking at it four different ways. So we're looking at it in the top left-hand side, we're looking at the high-level overview, and we recognize that we've got two impurities that are particularly at risk, we then drill down and say, OK, so what is it about those? And then as we drill, if we know that uh, this one is uh, particularly important, we can then drill, it, drill down and look at this, uh, this one. So you can look at the overview, zoom and filter, details on demand. So it's about looking at the same data set, but in different ways to get different insights. So it's all about linking different ideas together. And... So where's the problem? The problem is that um, you know, when uh, the technology, the industrial revolution started, there were Luddites who took uh, sledgehammers to machines to, to break them up. Today's Luddites don't use sledgehammers. Today's uh, Luddites sit on the backsides and do nothing. So one of the things is, how do you actually move from doing what is you know, traditionally accepted now to actually giving people the confidence to kind of uh, try new methodologies and new techniques. And one of the things that we found very, um, very uh, uh, empowering is to actually give people to uh, simulations. And the, and the idea of this is that if you go out into the laboratory, you know, working in the laboratory is very expensive. You go out and you put your heart and soul into it, you're doing reactions, and if things go wrong, you've invested an awful lot of effort. If you give people a simulation to do like this, where they just simply have to, for example, I'm going to move the temperature down and I'm going to put the reagent up and then get them to press a button, they can learn very quickly. And there's no real cost to that. So if things do go wrong, actually, you know, all they've done is move some electrons around on a page. So you can actually get them to uh, play the game of, 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 of simulation, and then at the end it gives you the scorecard of how you've done and how much money you've made or how much money you've lost. So it gives you that kind of real uh, idea of uh, return on investment. And, um, and people enjoy this. And at the end of this kind of session where we do this bit, people understand that there's a big... Uh, difference between how they've traditionally gone about thinking about experimentation to this more structured approach. So, um, a couple of slides ago, I showed you a case study, and you know, traditionally case studies are the way that you you get people to uh, uh, think about taking on new techniques. Um, but one of the other things you can do is you can get people to... So what's the next stage on from doing the simulation? Well, you can, you can show them the technique, but using very simple experimentation. So, so, so rather than uh, doing experiments in the lab, you do what we call laboratory of life experiments. So if I have... Uh, an effervescence tablet here. What you can do is you can get the students to think about, okay, I want to, I want to create a tablet that is going to dissolve in 20 seconds. How can I do that? Well, we've got water, and we've got a tablet, and we can pop the tablet in the water, and you can measure it. And you think, well, that, you know, nothing could be simpler than that. But if you get a, a group of students to do this, and you get them to time it, and I should have, I should have got you to estimate the, the length of time it's doing to this. So it's still fizzing away, and I can hear it, and it's, it's still uh, uh, dissolving. And what, you get, what you're then getting to do is the students to think about what would alter the, the rate of this uh, dissolution. So what factors are important? And, uh, and then at this point, the, the tablet's fully dissolved. 
and you get them to say, to measure the, the time it's taken for that to solution. And the interesting thing is, even with something as simple as that, you'll get a lot of variability. And so it's a really good way of explaining to students and get students to appreciate that there is variation in their experimentation. There's always this temptation, if you're doing one factor of time experiment, to say that when I move from one experiment to another experiment, that the reason that's happening is because I've altered the temperature. It could actually just be the variability of the measurement system. So, um, so that's, uh, that's uh, trick number two. Trick number three is the envelope itself. So what you do now is you, t you, you go to the back of the envelope and you say to students, write down the factors that might affect that dissolution of the tablet. And so you get them to think about that. And then you think, get them to think about, OK, how would you measure that? So you'll think, get them to think about the responses. And then you get to think about, well, what's the cost of that experimentation? So you think about how many experiments could you do within a certain time? And then you've got to think about, well, what's the goal of that experiment? So is the goal to dissolve the tablet in 20 seconds? And, and why is that? What's important about that? So get them to really think about why they're doing the experiment. Are they trying to just get conditions that actually get that 20, 20 second dissolution? Or are they really, is the purpose of this experimentation to understand which factors are more important than others? Or is it to understand where you're getting most variation? So there's some really kind of clear um, uh, things that you can do. So it's, you do it on the back of an envelope because as, as Churchill said, planning is everything, the plan itself is useless. So what this does is it gets over the, you know, they know that they don't, it's not like doing a really structured um, uh, uh, experimentation plan on, on your PC, on, you know, very detailed plan. You're just getting to, to really think about the experimentation process itself. So uh, the key thing to this is all, all models are wrong, but some are useful. So it's about thinking about the tools themselves. What are the, what are the tool, when do you need to use the tools and, and why do you use, need to use tools and making sure you use the tools at the most appropriate time. And finally, uh, so, so I just want to kind of summarize by saying I've taken you through the opportunity. You know, there's lots of opportunity to make data and model data more effectively. Um, the technology you can do nowadays to do that is awesome. You've got automation, you've got modeling, you've got visualization techniques. But at the end of the day, you've got people who run that. And it's all about the most challenging thing is actually changing the way people work, changing people's behavior. So um, when you come to think about uh, new technology, think about not only how you actually solve the technical problems, but how you're going to bring about that change as well. Make things easier for people to make those uh, small steps to those big, uh, big improvements in the way that we do business. Thank you.